Hi, everyone. Welcome to Financial Fitness for Families. My name is Lena Nebel, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer with BFG Financial Advisors. And I'm here with my colleague, Claudia Glover, who is also a lead advisor. And this is our first webinar together, so we are super excited to talk about this topic. It's something we get to talk about um, with clients every day, so I'm looking forward to having a conversation about our families and lessons we've learned and how those lessons um, you know, help our clients and families. So the, the first slide we're going to have is our good old compliance one here for you that we need to have, and then now we can get the show started. Um, before we begin, though, I thought it would be good to just provide a brief introduction on our background. So Claudia, why don't you go first? Um, tell us how you became a financial advisor, a little bit of uh, demographics about your family and why this is an important topic for you. Sure, thanks Lena, happy to be here. Um, yeah, I've been in this industry really since I graduated college. I kind of went in knowing what I wanted to do and I've had the opportunity to work in various different parts of the industry from uh, working on a bond trading desk to managing a portfolio um, to being a financial advisor. Um, my kind of love for the industry really started um, with my family, with my dad really teaching us from a really young age about, you know, paying yourself first and saving um, and really watching them start from the ground up and, and building something that's, that's really awesome to, to see and that they're now going to be able to have a legacy. So, um, you know, this is a topic that's really close to my heart. Um, working with families and clients is one of my favorite things to do. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Great, great. Yeah, our, uh, I know when we've had conversations, uh, I think our, our background and our career is fairly similar on, you know, that we've always been in this industry and, it, and it's always been exciting for us. I, I too kind of started right out of college and um, I went right into a financial planning firm that did comprehensive planning. So I was on the financial planning train really on day one, um, probably because of uh, an internship when I was uh, at a stockbroker's office cold calling, realized that's probably not the best uh, use of my time and experience, and so kind of went a different route. Um, but I know we're going to talk about our, our our parent situations later on, how we talk to our, our parents about money. Um, but the reason I got into it was the opposite of you. Um, my parents did not do a good job in savings and did not talk to us about money. So I kind of got into it because of uh, not having that information and, and seeing my family argue about money constantly. Um, I, I think that, you know, these past few years, we can both agree that financial literacy across all ages has become um, extremely important, uh, important topic at all levels. And when you and I have gone to schools and we speak to teenagers about the importance of savings or how we get jobs in the financial industry, um, we found the need to have, have this conversation um, that much more. So we're going to be talking about families. Um, tell me a little bit about your family and you can include the dog. That's okay. But give me a little bit of demographics about your family for the audience. Um, yeah, absolutely. I have um, my husband, Marcus, and I have been together since we were teenagers. So we kind of have been on this, this journey and figuring things out um, as we go. We now have two girls, Olivia and Catherine. They are um, 12 and 8 and our little puppy, Teddy. Um, and, you know, watching them grow up is, is awesome. But, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about today, it's the challenges of, you know, having – having girls and exposing them um, to the financial industry um, and also their different ages because, you know, the four year gap between the two of them, there are a lot of things that we can kind of start talking to Olivia about, um, but Catherine's not quite ready for it. Um, so, you know, we're uh, kind of balancing both worlds. Yeah, I think family, we could probably. You know, <laughs> I think we could do just a whole webinar on raising girls. I think yeah, that would be a, a big, big popular item. Uh, I, uh, I, my husband and I um, have been together for over 20 years. Um, he's in the pharmaceutical industry, but he's always been in sales his entire life. Uh, and then we have three children. We have Sophie, who is 16, Ashley, who is 12, and then JJ, who is nine. And of course, our dog Marley, can't forget her. 
Um, but I agree, there's different conversations you have with your kids at different stages of life. And, and we're at a big stage right now to where my oldest is starting to look at colleges. She's working now. Um, so there's a lot of topics that we can, we can chat about all the way down to my son who just got his report card and, and wanted to know, can he get rewarded financially for getting good grades in third grade? Um, and, and that's exactly how I was too growing up. So it's, it's an interesting conversations with each of them, and they both view money differently. Um, so let's just kind of jump right in. I appreciate uh, you kind of sharing with the audience uh, your background and everything. So let's now start focusing on the family in our first section. Yeah, absolutely. I'll kind of take the lead from here and ask you questions first. Um, okay. So just kind of starting from the beginning, um, you know, when, in your opinion, should a couple start talking about finances um you know if they're thinking about getting married do they do they do it before do they do it after what's kind of the guidance that you give to to people getting ready to start a family that's uh, a great question you know i think it's really going to be dependent on their situation but i would say rule of thumb is if somebody is going to start uh, living together and they want to build their financial future together. I think that's really when you start the conversation. Obviously, on the second date, you don't want to say, so tell me about your 401k and how much money are you making. Um, but if you know that you want to kind of take those next steps with that partner, um, it is important to talk about what what do they think about money? Um, how are they spending? Do they have a lot of student loan debt? Do they have car loans? Do they want to buy a house? Do they want to stay in the area? So I think it's important to, to have those conversations. And two people may not uh, agree on finances. They may have completely different viewpoints on it, but that's part of those conversations. There's no right or wrong um, answer to you know those questions when they talk about it, but I think you have to start those conversations when you want to to build that family. Uh, Ten years into the relationship, you don't want to know at that point um, kind of that they've had these separate bank accounts or something else. So really starting to include them in the conversation. You and I have both had experiences with clients who've been together for 50 plus years, but usually one person is the primary person that's answering a lot of the financial questions or is the the one who knows uh, what's going on in their financial world. And so you and I have always um, tried to encourage that other spouse to be part of those meetings as well, um, because it, it is important. They need to understand, um, you know, where money is going, uh, what the debt looks like, what are they saving for, um, you know, and I, I say all these things, and I remember um, probably about five years ago, my husband said to me, are we putting money away for college? Because I was the one who was, who's was primarily handling it, and he just, you know, is trusting and not really paying attention to some of those things. Um, so that's when I realized, you know what, we need our own financial advisor. So fortunately, um, you know, at the company, you you are our financial advisor. So sitting down with us and, and talking about everything. Now, my spouse is more aware of what's going on with savings towards all these different goals. Right. Yeah, it really does make a difference when you can finally get both couples in, this, in the same room um, and get them kind of talking about, you know, things that maybe you've only been talking to one for some time. Um, but, you know, that reminds me of some situations, too, when you come across clients that you find once you get them talking about habits that they they maybe don't necessarily agree on, you know, what they should be saving for first. Some clients think college should come first. Others think retirement comes first. Um, others maybe disagree on on just the level of spending or saving. How How do you tackle those conversations? Um, I think, you you know, part of our job is also being a counselor, a therapist, you know, you're dealing with different personalities. And in those conversations, because they're often, you know, it's important to prioritize, um, talk about the things that are the most important for each of them, try to find a compromise. And in a perfect situation, being able to hit all of the goals. That, that's the dream, right? You want to be able to check the box for retirement, education, short-term goals, long-term goals, whatever they may be. Um, but one person may think that um, they should pay down the house quicker versus maybe saving towards something else. And that could be due to their discomfort with debt. So the more questions that we can ask clients, the more we can understand why people's behavior 
is what it is based on their their viewpoints on money. Um, at, as I say, there, there's no right or wrong answer. We usually give the financial answer on, I can show you why it may make sense to do one thing or another, but in the end, that client's going to make that comfort decision. So a popular item that we get all the time is I want to be able to fully fund my kids' education, and if I have to work longer for retirement, I'm going to do that. And that's fine to say that. And we have other clients that may say, I want my, my kid to have some skin in the game. They're required to pay their, their last year of school um, or something like that. So you have to understand kind of what their goals are. And then also understanding, well, maybe they feel that way because of how they paid for education, but realizing that there's a lot of ways to fund education and to pay for education, but there's not a lot of ways to fund and pay for retirement that could sway their decision of from one to the other. So I think as a as a certified financial planner, it's our job to provide all the information to help them make an educated decision. Um, but in the end, it's going to be their decision and it's and it's their comfort level as well. Yeah, those are some great points. And well what are you mentioned that your um your oldest is getting ready to go to college. So you're <laughs> in the client seat um right now for some of this planning. What are the some of the things that you and your husband are doing to get ready for for college? Um, other than getting completely stressed out, um, you, you know, it, it's, I, I find it interesting that, you know, in this industry over 20 years and helping clients save for college and telling them the things that they should do and the, and the things that they should talk to their kids about. And then now I'm, I'm right in the thrust of it. So, um, you know, just a, a little bit of kind of what we've been doing. Um, we have been saving into a 529 um, which for education. And I realized early on that during the holidays and birthdays, my kids would just get a lot of stuff from the grandparents, things that they wouldn't play with after, you know, three days. And I started to tell the grandparents, whatever you were going to spend on a present for them, just put it right into their 529 and I'll match it. And so it was a way for the grandparents to feel like they're also contributing towards education. It could be $25 or $50. Um, it allowed me not to accumulate more stuff that the kids really don't need. Um, but what it also allowed um, the kids to see as they got older, that there was money going into something. So it kind of forced the discussion with them about the fact that, yes, we do have some money set aside for you. Um, it may not be enough you know, depending on where you go. So right now with my oldest who's 16, she'll be 17 in just a couple months, um, you know, she wants to kind of, you know, roam wherever, and that could be involving a plane flight. And so I said to her, um, you know, it, it's putting boundaries on certain decisions because financially we're not going to pay for certain things. And so I was, I was having this conversation with her um, because it was almost a, a reality check for her of, well, wait, isn't it your job as my parent to pay for my education? Um, and I said, it, you know, that's not in the rule book right now that that's our responsibility. Um, it's a, a great uh, accomplishment for parents when they're able to do that. But what I have seen all too often is that parents spend sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year on education, and the kid has no idea what they want to do. Um, they don't take it seriously. They um, raid the retirement accounts, or they leverage the house. Um, for some kids, they go to these schools and they take these massive student loans, and it's tough in that they can't even pay them back because of the job that they're getting. So. I've been having um, some real world discussions with Sophie. And so uh, I said to her, you may find a school. And she did. She found one is about $50,000 out of state, uh, 50000 a year. And so I told her the school that's in state that she was thinking of is half the cost. So the difference of $100,000 over that four year time period, will she get an education worth $100,000 more? Is there that much more added benefit? Um, and she's kind of pushing towards uh, business management, marketing, kind of that route. Um, so it's not anything that's in a in a niche for her, which I could say, okay, you're going to an architecture school or something and you need that type of education. Um, so the important thing is communication with the kids, right? It's, it's talking about how much the school costs, 
How is it going to get paid? So now she's starting to think about, well, if I go to this school that's on her list that costs less money and she can walk away with no debt because we fully funded it because it was kind of within our budget, she's now putting that ownership on her and giving her a little bit more financial independence and freedom um, as it relates to the college choices and everything. And I think all too often, unfortunately, parents just say, we'll send you wherever you want to go and we'll figure it out. That may not be the best decision for most. Really good points. Um, before we kind of switch gears, I don't want to, you know, forget that families kind of all look different. We've spent a lot of time talking about mm -hmm. kids, but what about families that, that look different or, you know, potentially two partners um, w without kids yeah. or, you know, just um, four-legged kids? You know, what kind of advice do you give to them or how is it different? How is it the same? You know, I, I would say that the communication overall is the same, but you're just funding towards different goals. You know, as it relates to estate planning, um, your your wills, your powers of attorneys, your medical directives, um, your legacy planning, your legacies may look a little different. It may be that your assets may be going to nieces or nephews or charitable organizations, um, friends. It doesn't have to obviously um, always be focused on on children, um, but you're talking about what you're saving for, um, how you should communicate together in in developing a financial plan and amassing wealth. Um, and also when you look at, you know, your risk management and, and, and life insurance and the types of protection that you would need as well, um, I'd say the communication style is it's honestly everything's the same except you're just funding towards different goals. Um, our four-legged creatures, don't forget, you do want to put in your estate documents, you name guardians for your pets as well, because if something should happen to the two of you, you want to make sure that your dog or your cat, your pets are provided for and taken care of. So all too often, unfortunately, people actually omit the family dog. Um, and then sometimes there's actually arguments over who's going to be able to take care of that animal. And, and for some, it may seem um, pretty sim silly, but for a lot of us, they're the family pet. You want to make sure that they're provided for as well. Sadly, we can't get a deduction for them on our tax return yet, but who knows? Um, so I, I think um, even when you have two partners, whether or not they're you know going to have kids or adopt kids, whatever it may be, there's a lot of great gifting strategies, saving strategies that the two of them can have. Um, their wealth could potentially get amassed much quicker because they may not have certain expenses, but they may also want to do more traveling and different types of spending as well. So understanding the spending habits of, of a couple without any children or a single individual versus somebody who's a family of five or six. Uh, you know, things look a little bit differently, but in the end, you're still coming back to the, the overall theme of financial planning. Great. That's great. Um, all right. Well, why don't um, we switch gears a little bit and talk about some strategies um, with kids? Sure, sure. So if we go to um, the second section, so now I get to uh, interview you, which right. will be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first thing on this list, it, it says the three jar method. And, you know, this is something that, you know, we hear often. I remember Eric, uh, Eric Brotman, our CEO, talking about this a couple years ago with, with what he did with his daughter, Brooke. Tell me, um, you know, basically describe what the three jar method is. Um, for our listeners out there and why it can be a good idea, you know, how you how you can teach good habits with kids um, in using that type of method. Yeah, no, this is a, a method that I really like and I think you can use from a, a really young age. You know, the the idea is just what it says. You kind of have these three different buckets or three different jars that we can um work, you know, each one has a, a different goal. Typically you tend to hear, you know, the first one is you pay yourself. So kind of your, your savings, your 401k, you know, maybe another one, a family is charitably inc inclined, or maybe they're saving for a vacation. Um, but that's kind of the second bucket. Um, and then your third bucket is, is your, your fun and, and your spending bucket, but teaching kids, you know, from a really early age that, Hey, if I get a dollar or five and I'm going to immediately fill, you know, my first two buckets before, I can spend from the third one is is a really good way to um, build that healthy habit of not just spending everything you bring in because 
you know, what, what we're finding um, is that unfortunately, the, you know, the world has changed and pensions are around less and less. And so people have to fund some very big goals like retirement um, later in life. And starting with the simple, you know, three jar method um, could really be helpful to building those really good habits. Um, you know, I mentioned my, my dad earlier, and this was one of the things that he was really, really big on was, you know, from your very first paycheck, don't ever get a paycheck without filling that first bucket, which in this case was the four, the 401k. So, you know, this is something that I've used with, with my kids. Um, it's, it's easy. It's fun. You know, with the, with the little ones, it could be, you know, marbles or jars that you start to fill up and not necessarily money, but if they do their chores, you know, they can, um, if the jar gets full, they can get a reward, but it's just, really, really basic. Um, and all the way up to working with clients, um, even now, you know, they can have different, different saving strategies. You talked about college, we talked about retirement, um, you know, we've, we can plan for vacation. So although we're not necessarily filling the jars, we're still kind of having these different goals in mind that we're constantly funding towards. No, I think that that's great. And it, it's, it's funny, you said, you know, it's just, it's a simple method and it's fun. And sometimes those are the most overlooked methods are the simple methods. I mean, I remember back in the day, the, the envelope um, where everybody would put, you know, my mortgage payment is going in an envelope and then my utilities are going in an envelope. And um, so I think it's great to be able to make it fun, especially for little ones. But when you think about as they get older and um, you have teenagers, um, you know, there's Venmo and PayPal and Zelle, and then there's the bank accounts that they have and everything. And, and then now they go to college and then they're getting introduced to, to credit cards. Um, what, what is your, you know, strategies on helping teenagers start to, uh, create good habits regarding money, you know, especially if they are working or babysitting, um, how should they start to create good habits, you know, with all these different resources that are out there? Yeah, absolutely. I think so, you know, every time they, they get paid, I think, um, talking about what the money is going to be used for, making sure that they're saving, you know, all teenagers have goals, whether it's going to um, out to eat with friends or, you know, buying that new phone or buying that new outfit, um, but also continuing to save for the long term. Um, but you mentioned all of those, the, the cash apps, you know, I don't know that I know how to use them all right now, but I think it's important to um, stay up to date with them and give them access to different types of, of money. Um, you know, when, when we were growing up, you had your cash, really, you would, you would go babysit and, you know, somebody would, would give you a cash, occasionally a check. Um, I still learned how to balance a checkbook in school. Um, but now we have all of these different types of accounts. And I think teaching them how to use it early, because I think there's something about, you know, not having that $20 bill in your hand. Um, you know, you kind of sometimes lose um, the idea of how much that $20 is really worth, or sometimes the money just appears in your account. And it's, you know, a lot easier to spend if you're just swiping a card. Um, so I think that's, that's a really good idea. Obviously, opening up a bank account, a savings account, teaching them the difference between the two, um, you know, trying not to, to take money out of the savings account, if that's truly for long term, um, and then exposing them to credit card, you know, building credits um, is really, really important and really difficult to do when you're starting from zero. So there are various credit cards out there that teenagers can have access to where you can monitor their spending. They have very low limits. You can teach them to pay it off from their bank accounts every month um, so that it's not accruing the interest um, and just kind of talking to them about the importance of doing that. You know, credit cards also have benefits. Um, once you kind of get into some of the, you know, the more fun ones, but I think in the beginning, allowing them to build that credit because eventually they will want to buy a car. Um, they may not have the cash for it, um, or they may want to buy that first house and you want to actually have some of that credit there. You know, even looking for that first apartment, um, you don't want to be co-signing on everything. So um, it's, it's really important to let them spread their wings just like as they are in life into some of those other areas. No, no, absolutely. Um, you know, it was interesting when you talked about balancing a checkbook and, and learning that in school. And, and sadly, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why you and I wanted to do this webinar, because financial literacy doesn't happen at the level that it should in, you know, in the, in the school system and, um, and also at homes and trying to make it a more popular conversation and everything. And so when you talk about 
you know, setting aside money in the bank accounts or the cash apps, you know, at some point they're going to have this increased amount of savings and they're working. Um, should they start buying stock? And if they're going to start buying stock or have an investment account, how would they even begin to do something like that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's it's a great idea. You know, sometimes even buying stock for younger children can be like a grandparent gift. Um, what I always tell people, you know, do it where it's easy, do it where it's accessible for them. Um, there are a lot of different options out there, um, and and do it where it's low cost. But an easy way to get started is make sure that they're owning things that they understand. You know, with teenagers especially, it's fun because you tell them, you know, go and buy the things that you are actually spending money on. Um, buy the stocks of the restaurants that you're going to eat with your friends. Um, so, you know, that would be a good way to kind of get them to understand the connection between, you know, the things they do for fun and kind of the business world. But, you know, if, if kids are working, you know, even if it's just babysitting or mowing the lawn and they have um, any sort of earned income, you know, I always remind people that they can fund a Roth IRA and a Roth IRA is a great place to start earning stock. Um, this is something parents can fund. This is something that you could fund from the um, the kids' savings and then buy some stocks in there because that allows it to grow tax-free for, you know, the rest of their lives and then come out um, without any taxes at the end. So it could be a really, really good way to get them started uh, filling that retirement bucket early. Yeah, and I think um, that's also the, the challenge, right? It's the how do you get a 16-year-old to even start thinking about retirement down the road and going back to one of the first things you talked about, which was the three jar method. If you're starting those conversations early on, then it's an easier discussion when they get older. Um, so I, I really appreciate, you know, kind of your, your thoughts and comments about, you know, kind of that, that teenager age period and, and setting up money, whether it's in the cash accounts and the bank accounts and really monitoring the spending and the credit cards. Um, but now we, we kind of have a shift, right? We, you know, the, the kids are, are doing great and they're on their own. And now all of a sudden we're having conversations with our parents and other family members about their, uh, um, their challenges and everything. Um, so in our next section in, in talking to our parents about finances, um, tell us a little bit, you know, I know you, you talked about your, your parents um, really focused on with you and your siblings um, in the importance of money and the importance of savings. What was, you know, in your opinion, what was kind of your, your first memory that you had as it relates to, to, uh, to finances and to money when you were younger? Um, well, I just always remember my dad being a really good saver, just, you know, always, always saving, you know, now t in talking to my mom and looking back, um, you know, she'll tell me, you know, anytime I got a raise, I never got to see it because your dad would always save it. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of lived off of, you know, a, a modest income most of their lives and, and just made, you know, really smart decisions, didn't buy um, houses that they couldn't afford, didn't buy cars that they couldn't afford. Um, and it was always a conscious decision of the things that, that we spent money on as a family, you know, where we went on vacation, where we went out to eat, um, were all kind of things that were, were within um, what they could afford. And, and over the years, you know, as my parents, um, you know, made more money, that kind of changed, but you could kind of see that they never, never lived beyond their means. Um, but, you know, it was really when I got that first, that first paycheck and having that conversation with my dad about, the importance of starting your 401k because they they had to start late um, so they had to be really really aggressive in their savings so I think some of my memories you know for me I'm like oh that's really cool good habits um, you know and maybe when they think about it it was more of a you know we had to do this to play some catch up so starting from day one um, I was able you know to save and and it you know in where I am today feel comfortable that that we're headed in the right direction but um, yeah, it's really just been from, you know, watching my parents kind of um, do it throughout their lives. Um, what about you? I know your story is a lot different than mine. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, our our background, and I would say everybody's background and how they're dealing with money always comes back to how they were raised. You know, when you look at um, clients that were born in the Depression and they saw what their parents went through, they had very different money habits than people who um, weren't during weren't born during that time period. So it's that 
that spend versus save mentality. And I would say um, my story is completely opposite than yours. My parents spent beyond their means. They did not have money. They did not do any savings and they did not talk to us about the importance of it. Um, and that's probably why I was constantly trying to earn money, whether it was making breakfast in the morning and giving them a menu with prices and kind of forcing them to pay me, you know, a dollar for a bowl of cereal or something, or putting on piano recitals in the family room and charging admission, uh, lemonade stands. I mean, I was always trying to make a quick buck somehow, <laughs> just so I could have something to spend. Um, and so my parents actually didn't start saving until my dad was 50. And that was when his mother had passed away. So when my grandmother had passed away, um, my dad was the only child alive and um, he received an inheritance. Um, it wasn't a significant inheritance, but for them, it was huge amounts of money because it was the first time they actually had money. Um, and I would love to say that they uh, saved it very frugally and, and didn't spend it, um, but it didn't happen that way. Unfortunately, they had a bad experience with a financial advisor. Um, and so, you know, through that, I think I, I realized just more and more the importance of savings for the long term. Um, and, you know, going through that process to this day um, with my family, it's the, it's the constant talks about, about monies. Um, so when we talk about, you know, open discussions to avoid surprises, um, you and I both are very fortunate in that we can have these conversations with our parents. We can give them advice and we can talk about, you know, how to handle certain things. But all too often we see clients that have challenges with, you know, mom or dad or a sibling or just some family member um, that's impacting their financial world. Um, so what's your advice in, you know, when, when clients come in and they talk about, you know, I don't know if my parents have long-term care. I don't know if they even have a will. I don't know where this stuff is because usually those individuals, those parents, never had those conversations with their kids, right? They were always very quiet about money. So what's some of your advice on um, talking to kind of the adult children and being able to approach their parents with those types of conversations to avoid those surprises when it's a little too late? Yeah, no, because you're absolutely right. When it's, you know, when something happens or, or there's a medical emergency or, you know, you, you need to be able to step in as, as medical power of attorney or financial power of attorney and you find out that you can't, that's a really, really tough situation. So, um, you know, as I'm talking to clients, you know, we always ask the question, um, you know, are you responsible? Are you a part of your parents' estate plan? Do you know if you're going to have to care for them in any, in any way if they need medical care or long-term care? And a lot of people don't know. A lot of people never have thought to have that conversation with their parents, I think, because it's, it's a little uncomfortable, right? It's a little uncomfortable um, asking the person who took care of you and whose responsibility it was to put you through college and, you know, save, save for you to turn around and have to um, understand. But the reality is, is if without that open line of communication, um, things become very difficult. Um, and in families where there are multiple children, um, you know, or grandchildren, um, things can get very messy if it's not clear what the parents' wishes are um, or who they, you know, want to be in charge of the situation. So, and especially with long-term care, I think that's such an important discussion to have because a lot of times we think about, okay, well, what happens when somebody passes in the estate? And more often than not, people, you know, understand that a little bit, but but the reality is somebody could need long-term care for many, many years, and it could be really expensive um, or just burdensome on the family um, just because of how difficult it is. So I think understanding not only what the parents' wishes are, what their financial ability is, um, but really just trying to open up the discussion. You know, I would just recommend try a, one question here or there at the next family gathering. Like, you know, mom, I, I, I just did my estate plan is yours done? Or, you know, I, I just, I know this person who had to go into a long-term care facility, you know, would you ever consider it? But it's, you know, I think the most difficult part of it is having the initial conversation and just kind of getting over that hump of it being uncomfortable 
um, and then realizing that it comes from a place of, okay, you know, this, this really benefits all of us. It's not, it's no longer a matter of prying about finances or prying about, you know, uh, personal things. Um, so I would just recommend, you know, in whatever way, whatever's comfortable, there are so many different ways to approach it. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier about, you know, potentially gifting to the grandkids. Um, really, anytime there's the option to have that financial conversation, um, you know, try to try to ask a little bit. Now, I think you you definitely bring up a lot of good points there. And, you know, as it relates to long term care insurance and just long term care in general, I think the theme that we get a lot from clients is they always say, well, I don't want to be a burden to my family, right? I don't want um, people to have to take care of me. And so they try to take care of everything in advance so that they're not, um, you know, causing undue, you know, emotional strain on any family members. And so, you know, I would add on that when you're having these conversations with your parents, um, going about it from, like you said, it's, it's a place of good and it's, and it's a place of, um, you know, I want to make sure that things are taken care of because it's going to be so hard when I lose you, right? You know, we've seen it all the time on how money, finances, and then the emotional stress can really just kind of put a, a fog over a lot of decisions. So the estate planning documents are, are crucial. You know, they're the, they're the documents that are going to carry out certain wishes and everything and how they should go. And um, you talked about, you know, doing gifting, to um, to grandkids and, and you know having strategies about that. What are the what are the different ways if if somebody decided that they wanted to do more legacy planning? Um, you know, outside of just gifting traditionally to um, uh, a, a family member, you know, up to the annual limit. What are the other ways that people could do gifting besides just writing a check? Yeah, I mean there there are various other ways. You talked about um, contributing to a 529 plan. You know, grandparents could make um, gifts of of education directly to the school. Um, they, you know, that way there's there's no limit there. Um, you know, if um, you could consider life insurance, life insurance that would benefit not just the, the kids but the grandkids. Um, you, through estate planning, um, you could consider trusts and, you know, se segregate different accounts out in different ways. Um, I think, you know, taking a look at your uh, entire financial plan and the different types of accounts, um, you know, some things may be better off um, left to, to grandchildren or younger generations, different types of accounts. Um, you know, things like Roth IRAs that won't pay taxes on them when, when they're passed on could go to different family members. So there are a lot of ways to, to gift in life. I know I come across a lot of clients that say, I don't, I don't want to wait, <laughs> you know, till I'm gone to, to be able to gift. Um, but there, there are various strategies where they could do that um, throughout the years. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's, it's great to be able to have the dialogue with, you know, parents and grandparents about their financial future. You know, we always say you can't take it with you. And as long as it's not derailing their current plans, um, it's great to be able to see them do some creative strategies now while they're alive and they see the enjoyment within the, um, the recipient's eyes too on what they're receiving. Um, you know, before we get to questions from the audience, you know, I was, I was thinking about, um, you know, our, our parents and if they could, if we were their financial advisors when, when they were first starting. And I think about, you know, the challenges specifically that, that my parents had um, and what they should have done differently to kind of minimize the, that. Um, I would say that my, my parents Parents, you know, they didn't ask questions. They, they didn't think about their future. And I think if they, if they started to focus on, you know, what happens when they're in their 60s or their 70s um, would have definitely changed their spending habits. And, you know, it kind of goes all the way back to the beginning when they're young, when, you know, they're children and starting to learn about money and, and making it um, part of their routine. Um, so I, I think back to my parents and if they thought about that future of, well, if we continue to spend like this, we're not going to have an enjoyable retirement, right? Um, so if you were your financial, if you were the financial advisor for your family when they were first starting, what would you have recommended that they did differently? I mean, it sounds like your, your parents were already good savers. Did they, did they have any challenges? 
well, you know, they 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 didn't necessarily have challenges savings, but it's it's funny the challenges that we see now because they did a great uh-huh. job of saving and investing, um, but they weren't necessarily active in their investments. And so now we're we're kind of in a position where you're faced with, you know, do do we sell and pay taxes on things that we've owned for 20 years? You know, do we continue to hold them for the rest of our lives? Um, you know, how do we diversify? So certainly, um, you know, if I would have been guiding them from the very beginning, I think diversifying from the very beginning, kind of some of those good, you know, we're not talking about portfolios today, but some of those basic, you know, rebalancing strategies to kind of um, keep things easily available and, and easily liquid. So I, I absolutely, you know, nobody gets it 100% right, um, you know, but um, I think that would be the, the one thing would be to be a little more, a little more active. Um, I think in their savings, it would have made a difference. I, I think you bring up a really good point. And, you know, we, when we talked in the beginning about how we talk to our kids a little differently because of their ages, different phases of life, different stages of life, you're going to give different recommendations on what they're doing. Um, so, you know, starting younger and, and starting to learn about diversification and everything could be helping them, as you said, now in really trying to minimize the taxes. And then, of course, in the next 10 years, I'm sure there's going to be kind of a new topic, you know, to be to, to having that discussion as well. So, um, I, you know, really the, the the financial fitness for families it's, I would say, all ages, right? And it's all aspects of their life, whether they're just starting out, they, you know, just moved in together, to now we're planning their retirement party, to now we have some significant health concerns and we need to shift some things around. Um, it's an ongoing conversation. So I'm super excited that we had the opportunity to be able to share, you know, some of these topics and everything with everybody. Um, so I'll ask Sarah if there are any questions out there that, um, you know, Claudia and I should be answering. Hi. Uh, yes, if anybody wants to send in any questions, please do so in the questions tab or you can even send them in the chat. Uh, we do have a few. So I'm going to start with, um, I'm a first generation American. If my parents do not have a will or savings for retirement, how can I encourage them to start one now? Some Hispanic families do not take savings too seriously or write a will. Um, yeah, I, you know, I can take that one. I, I think, again, um, explaining the, the importance um, of the will and the importance of savings and, and opening up the discussion and kind of thinking beyond oneself and, and what happens after that, I think is, is really where it starts with, with anybody. Um, you know, building good saving hab- savings habits is really difficult, but it, I think if you start small, um, it's a little less daunting. Um, so thinking about big, big goals and, you know, why we're doing this um, can sometimes be a little overwhelming, but just starting month to month, paycheck to paycheck. Um, but with parents, you know, it's, it's a delicate balance of how to um, start having that discussion um, and explaining the importance of a will. Um, You know, in different, I was actually listening to a a seminar not too long ago about the difference in estate planning across various different countries. And it's, it's insanely different. Um, And the belief of how people feel about how assets should pass on um, and to whom they should pass on can be very different depending on who you're talking to. So I think understanding the person's desires um, and values um, and then tying it into how can the will, how can these savings, how will that help you get there? But I think, you know, first of all, understanding what their goals are and then tying it together um, is really important. I think, too, um, you know, different states are going to have different rules as well. And not having that will could mean that that's the, the state they reside in could be taking some of that hard-earned money because they have passed away without a will, which is called intestate. And so that may be a motivation on somebody getting um, their estate documents done because they've been saving their whole life and they want to protect it and they definitely don't want it going to the state. I think that I've never seen the state and the federal government be beneficiaries on uh, any retirement accounts. You don't want them in the will. That too is another reason to, to definitely get those estate documents done. Great answers. Um, before, um, when we were talking about the kids, you had mentioned co-signing um, and not wanting to co-sign on 
um, everything for them. What is the impact that co-signing has on uh, your finances? I'll take that one. Um, you know, it really comes down to liability because co-signing is basically saying if the primary person can't make the payment, you're going to come to me. Okay. So if I co-sign, uh, my, my daughter ends up buying a house, but I have to co-sign on that mortgage and she just decides not to make that mortgage payment, I'm now responsible for that. So there can be a significant amount of liability on that. Um, I would try to encourage families as much as possible not to co-sign because it can definitely muddy the waters um, on responsibilities and expectations. Sometimes it can make Thanksgiving dinners not so much fun, um, but we also recognize that sometimes it's needed. You, you have to be able to co-sign. So again, coming back to the theme that Claudia and I have been talking about is communication, setting the expectations with that individual that you're co-signing with on those responsibilities. Um, but it can basically expose you to a lot of liability in the event that person decides to default on that loan. Claudia, did you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I, you know, I think Lena did a great job covering it. But yeah, understanding that you are ultimately responsible. I think sometimes people don't don't quite get that, that, you know, if, if the initial person doesn't make that payment, um, they, they will come after you and that will affect your credit score. So um, it's just it's important to understand what you're doing when you actually co-sign. Um, the, the reality is you'll probably have to do it um, once or twice to build that that credit. Like we talked about, there are other ways to do that without having to co-sign. Um, but be, you know, be careful about what you're doing it with. If it's that first apartment, I think, you know, that could be extremely helpful down the road. Um, but if it's, you know, a, a loan for a vacation to spring break, you know, maybe not as much. So <laughs> it's kind of un understanding um, what it is and, and what you're um, liable for. Um, earlier, it was also brought up um, about the college 529 plans. What happens if your um, kid doesn't end up actually wanting to go to college? Yeah, so there um, there are some options. And actually, just recently with um, the, the passage of Secure Act 2.0, um, we actually have some, some more options. So it used to be if you didn't use it for education, um, you kind of you you kind of lost it. You know, you could get your money back. You owed um, some taxes on, on the growth, but now um, there are some other options, including funding a Roth IRA for that person once they start working. You could always pass the account on to another beneficiary. So if there are siblings or other family members, you could change the beneficiary of that account. Um, and now you also have the ability to, to take um, some of that money back and, and repurpose it for retirement. If, you know, your child doesn't go to college and you haven't quite hit your retirement goals, you may be able to um, take some of the assets back for that purpose. And just uh, like we were talking about with estate planning, just the different rules at the state level, um, there's different rules within 529s at the state levels as well regarding deductibilities. And, and one of the things that Claudia and I do uh, when we're going through a client's tax return is confirming, did they take the deduction for their state's um, 529 plan? So we um, are in the state of Maryland. Maryland has a 529 plan. And if you contribute to that Maryland 529 plan, there's a deduction. Um, whereas if you lived in Pennsylvania, you get a bigger deduction, but you can contribute to any state's plan to get that deduction. So it's important when you decide to make uh, a decision first about doing any type of education funding and then utilize 529s, um, it's really important to understand, you know, that the 529 that you're um, deciding to uh, contribute to, the investment options, the, t the tax benefits as well. And then as Claudia just, um, you know, went through a great response and detailing, okay, well, if your kid doesn't go to school, okay, now here's all of your options that you have available. Um, we had one client where there was money left over from his son's 529 plan. His wife ended up going back to school and we used that money for the wife. And then when the daughter was ready to, to start college, we then transferred some money over to the daughter. So it was great to be able to, to use that for multiple people. And there's a lot of creative strategies um, that are out there, but it's uh, great to talk to your financial advisor and kind of going through the pros and cons of everything.
Uh, so a lot of conversations around retirement planning come from uh, employee benefits with like 401ks. What are some options for like spouses who don't work? Um, well, you know, spouses who, who don't work can save for retirement. I think this is um, a really good question and something that not a lot of people think about. But um, if you're um, in a family where one of you works and your spouse is, is working by staying home and taking care of the kids and, and kind of taking care of the household, you can still make spousal Roth contributions. Um, so while they may not have access to a traditional 401k through an employer, um, you can still contribute up to the annual limit for your spouse and have some of that money grow tax deferred. So um, it is something that, you know, I was having a conversation with a stay at home mom not too long ago who had no idea that, that she could have been doing this for the past 20 years. So it does make a difference if, if you can start early. Um, and working with a financial planner, you know, just looking at the overall um, household income and kind of where there is excess, you know, there are other opportunities to put money um, into accounts to, to save for retirement for a non-working spouse. Yeah, I, I agree 100 percent with what, you know, Claudia mentioned. I think it's good to kind of balance out, you know, the, the family balance sheet and the net worth. Um, but just because you're not working doesn't mean that there's not any strategies available for you. Is there I an think age? We have time for one, oh, sorry, I was going to say, Sarah, I think we got time for maybe one more question. Um, is there an age that it starts making sense to actually talk to kids about retirement, not just saving? I, I think, um, and I think, and I think Claudia and I will probably agree on this. And um, I definitely want to hear her comments regarding her girls because they're, you know, younger. Um, I think at any age, the earliest that they're starting to understand the concept of what is a dollar, you start talking about saving. And it doesn't have to be specific to retirement, but you can talk about long term. You can talk about, well, when you start driving or when you're, you know, uh, when you're a mommy or a daddy or, you know, when you decide to buy a house. You know, you, you start putting the concepts that they see right now in their family in front of them so that they can understand what that means. And then as they begin to get older, then I think you kind of start using the R word and can talk about, okay, well, what actually is retirement? And, you know, um, as Claudia and I mentioned, you know, both of our parents are retired. So our kids understand that Nana and Pop Pop don't have a job anymore. So what, is, what does that mean other than all the cruises and fun vacations they're taking? Um, what, what does that look like, whereas mommy and daddy are still working? Um, so I think, it, you know, when you start to introduce the concept of whether it's the three-jar method, whether it's having an allowance, whether it's getting financially rewarded for grades, whatever it may be, when they start to see dollars, quarters, um, you start approaching the different topics and everything with them. Yeah, I agree. And and I also think, you know, retirement um, can be a, a big, scary word for a lot of people and mm -hmm. one that kids don't understand. But one thing that we can talk about from very early ages all the way through um, is the concept of financial independence and financial freedom. And I think that at any point in time, if you have those good savings habits, even from a young age, whether it's completing your chores and being able to have your TV time all the way up to saving that money for, you know, yourself and in your car, I think the the idea of being financially fit and saving and giving yourself the the financial freedom to be able to do what you want to do um, and not depend on anybody else. You know, when, when you're a kid in, in if you start young, you can go buy uh, that lunch without having to ask mom and dad for money. So I think that stays true all the way through. And when we talk to clients about retirement, you know, many people are um, able to consider themselves financially free at a young age, but not necessarily to talk about retirement. So I think it's um, it's just the concept that, that, like Lena said, you talk about all the way through. It's all about building those, those good habits from the very beginning. Um, and I think if done right, then you will have the ability um, to do what you want to do later in life. I love how you said financial freedom. I, I know that that's, you know, part of our mission and our vision statement here. And um, I think that's just, it's so important to be able to have that financial freedom. Um, so 
I, I appreciate everybody's time for listening. Claudia, this is fantastic. I'm, I'm glad neither of us passed out in the middle of the webinar. So I think we can definitely do this again sometime. And um, please visit us for um, you know, additional educational resources. We have a lot of free resources around financial literacy at BrotmanMedia.com. If you want to have further conversations with Claudia or myself or any of our uh, certified financial planners at the office, please visit our website at bfgfa.com, or you can always scan the QR code as well. So thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you again. This was great, and look forward to the next one. All right.